Today, we're going to do the brunch time thing, but first, a few thoughts about the future of DBs and Ohio State, LSU, Michigan, because that's what we do. I give you a little bit of college football, and then we go talk about whatever the hell it is we want to talk about. Probably Cop Car, which we'll explain a little bit, was a horror show. Now, Sean Wade came back to Ohio State. He probably is going to be another first-round draft pick, right? Why? We'll get to that in a second. Derek Stingley Jr., not eligible for the draft in 2021. Neither is former five-star and Michigan safety Dax Hill. But all of these guys could potentially be the future of defensive back recruiting. Now, at Ohio State, you would be drafting Sean Wade on a number of different things, not to say the least of which is his ability to play significantly at the NFL level. But because Ohio State's just been so good at producing Defensive backs, they have seven first-round draft picks at defensive back since 2016. It's remarkable. They had 10 draftees in 2020. Now, every draft-eligible player for LSU that entered, every draft-eligible player for Ohio State that entered, either was selected or was signed to a undrafted free agent contract. So these places are really, really good at producing what the NFL wants to see at the next level, right? Now, Add to that, Dax Hill, who hoped to turn around Michigan, and when I say turn around, I mean actually win the Big Ten East, as opposed to, you know, just going nine wins and then ended up in the Citrus Bowl against an also-ran Alabama squad. But Dax is also the most instinctual high school football player I've ever seen in my life. He could play any position on any football field, and when he's going to play safety... For Don Brown in that defense, all I ask is that you let him loose, along with Darian Green Warren, who I think could be a Big Ten freshman of the year. He's that good at defensive back, particularly at cornerback. I also want to see what Sean Wade looks like against some class quarterbacks, and he won't really have that many opportunities this year because it ain't like he gets to face Justin Herbert at Oregon. That's going to be Tyler Shuck or Anthony Brown. Neither one of those guys is expected to be a first-round draft pick, but he might be able to face some top wide receivers. We'll have to wait and see, right? Maybe Nico Collins developed into something. Maybe Ronnie Bell developed into something. I don't know, right? Meanwhile, KJ Hamler is gone, so there's no Penn State dude to really put him up against. And when you're looking at their schedule and you're looking at the Big Ten, maybe you're talking about Oh, Rodney Bateman, perhaps, over at Minnesota. Maybe Tanner Morgan can show out. He probably will be the second-best quarterback in the Big Ten behind Justin Fields. But it just goes to show that the best practice and the best evaluation that you're probably going to get of an Ohio State defensive back this year is probably against Justin Fields when they're going 1v1 in practice. Also speaks to Kerry Coombs, right? Because Kerry Coombs has just been phenomenal when it comes to developing talent. It's one of the reasons why... Ryan Day went back to get him from Tennessee, the Titans that is, to be the defense coordinator after, well, the Greg Schiano experiment was awful. And when you took Ohio State's defense off of Schiano difficulty, you saw what Jeff Hafley was able to do, right? And now add to that, Josh Proctor comes into a year in which he is draft eligible and he hopes to take over the spot left vacant by Jordan Fuller. I like Josh Proctor, one, because he's from just down the road. Again, another Tulsa Metro kid went to Owasso High School, was a number one uh, one prospect in the state of Oklahoma in 2017. And he picked basically the apple of defensive backs. They are the best at producing them. They are the ones that we want the most. Now, add to that what Derek Stingley Jr. is going to have to do in LSU's secondary. I think they're going to be super talented. I also think they're going to be, you know, super inexperienced, which means they're probably going to be on this side of nine, eight wins, LSU fans fight me. I still think Derek Stingley Jr. is the best cornerback in college football today as a true sophomore. He's that good. Bill Bush has been pretty good at putting those safeties into the NFL as well. And we know what the pedigree is at LSU, particularly for defensive backs. Now, the argument for LSU or even Alabama is that they have more defensive backs that sustain themselves in the NFL rather than just being, you know, early round draft picks. That said, what Patrick... Peterson meant to LSU and what he meant to Arizona cannot be understated. The same thing with Taron Matthew, the honey badger, right? And then you can go and keep looking at Jamal Adams for the New York Jets. I think Elias Ricks has an opportunity to compete for one of those spots. I hope he does. I think Elias is phenomenal coming out of modern day. He was in that same defensive backfield a year ago, well, two years ago, with Darian Green Warren, and they were carpool buddies, and they're very close. I actually wanted to see them in the same conference, but yeah, we don't always get what we want. Then add to that, Jacoby Stevens, probably going to be the heir apparent to Grant Delpit, Paycom Jim Thorpe Award winner, second round draft pick by the Cleveland Browns. I expect him to be really good, right? You keep going down the list and you'll keep coming up with guys that just have made defensive back and particularly corner 
their job at LSU. And we'll see what happens with Derek Stingley Jr. Because a year ago, Ed Orgeron told his father he's going to play both ways. He didn't play both ways as a true freshman because Ed told his dad and kept his promise to his dad that I wouldn't do that to him. But he is that dynamic player. And then when you take a look at him on punt return, which he is a true freshman at LSU, you get how much they value Derek Stingley Jr. And while the number seven jersey goes to Jamar Chase, and I get it, but Litnikoff Award winner had like a million yards receiving and was shut down by Parnell Motley in the Peach Bowl, but you know, whatever. He's their best player, according to them. I think Derek Stingley Jr. is destined to wear that number seven jersey, which is iconic at LSU. Give him another year. And in that third year where everything is on the line for Derek Stingley Jr., you're going to see him break out. Now, leads me to Dax Hill. Dax Hill, for me, is the prototype of what you want in the NFL. He could play three positions. He's super fast. We're talking about 4-3 speed. Tremendous hands. A special teams dynamo. He can return kicks. He can return punts. And he can play both ways. Closest thing to Charles Woodson that has stepped on campus in Ann Arbor since Charles Woodson. I'm not kidding. If you put the kid in positions to succeed, he'll win you a Heisman Trophy. All right? He's that good. And the reason that I am pointing out Sean Wade, Derek Stingley Jr., and Dax Hill is because you look at the NFL, guys that usually go in the first round about six foot one. Okay, that's what you need. When we hear these defensive backs or defensive backs, defensive coordinators say that they want longer, rangier, faster cornerbacks, defense backs. I say you want unicorns. Cool. We all like unicorns. I like Pegasus as much as the next guy. I'd like to have a winged horse, but you know, they don't exactly grow up on trees. And yet and still you look at Ohio State. That's what they've been putting in there. Sometimes they get four stars. Sometimes they got five stars. Sometimes they're Denzel Ward and get three stars in their fourth overall pick in the 2018 NFL draft. Sometimes it just be like that, right? And then you continue to look down at what the NFL wants to do. And basically, since the Legion of Boom, we had this great thought, the the group think of we needed bigger, longer defensive backs that could take away guys and press coverage. And we need dudes that aren't afraid to come downhill and crush running backs and tight ends like Cam Chancellor, to which I'm going, yeah, man, the Legion of Boom was singular, all right? Richard Sherman at his best. Earl Thomas seeing everything all the time. He is a center fielder on par with that of Ken Griffey Jr. Willie Mays. He can take away whatever you want over the top, and you can play single high with him. That allows you to have Cam Chancellor, who is just an oversized linebacker, playing strong safety. You can just do that, right? You can't just do that everywhere else because you're not always going to have those sorts of guys, right? That said, 5'11", 5'10", you'll see those guys get drafted at corner and safety all the time now. Because when you see what the offenses are doing, they're getting shorter and they're getting faster at wide receiver. Hollywood Brown for the Baltimore Ravens. Tyreek Hill for the Kansas City Chiefs. Henry Ruggs goes in the first 15 picks to the Vegas Raiders and is the first wide receiver off the board. That tells you what the NFL values. They value speed and hands. Size isn't necessarily what it used to be. Used to be you had to have a possession wide receiver. A Terrell Owens type, a Michael Irvin type, a guy that perhaps you can get to on a 15-yard comebacker. Then we saw Randy Moss kind of took the top off the defense and was tall, and that's also another unicorn. So when you can't get that tall, but you still want to stay that fast, because guess what? If I can outrun you, it don't matter how tall I am. All you got to do is chuck it deep. And what Pat Mahomes could do is chuck it over them mountains, Uncle Rico style, and Tyreek Hill was always there. And when you look at guys like Travis Kelsey, yeah, okay, that's your matchup nightmare, but that's what your strong safety is for. That's what your Grant Delpit uh, type is for. That is why you took him in the second round. It's also one of the reasons why I put such an emphasis on a free safety that can drop down, but also a strong safety that can fill gaps and perhaps can run across the middle with your uh, dragging tight end, right? It's getting a shorter, faster, spacier league. One, because pass interference calls. Two, because we now have data that the NFL is acting on, thank God, to show that You score more points when you throw the football. You're more likely to win games when you throw the football, particularly on first and second down, as opposed to running the football. Now, there are old school cats in here that want to say that all you got to do is be running the football and run the football well, and you'll be okay. But the problem with that is once they stop the run, you fall off precipitously when we're talking about expected points added per play. So if you can run the ball, by all means, run the ball. But as soon as you can't run the ball, you're screwed, right? Which means you got to go back to throwing the ball which means you probably need to have defensive backs that can run with these wide receivers, that can pattern match, and that can play multiple positions and get more like this positionless NFL that we're so used to seeing. 